my name is Debbie Lyle. I'm a professor of international politics at Queen's University here in Belfast. Um, and I've published some work on how contested histories are made visible uh, in museum spaces, mostly around questions of war and conflict. And I had the great pleasure and the great honor uh, to be a member of the academic advisory group uh, that helped to shape the new Troubles and Beyond exhibition at the Ulster Museum. And for those of you who don't know it, that was where you were partying last night. That's where the exhibition is. Um, this session this afternoon uh, uses the National Museum Northern Ireland's experience of curating the Troubles and its legacy as a kind of case study. Uh, and in general, we wanted to consider how museums can work with key stakeholders to sensitively and responsibly curate dissent. And that's especially the case uh, with respect to contested histories. So part of the questions that we're trying to ask on this panel are around providing honest reflections about both the practicalities, actually, and the challenges of curating uh, difficult or contested histories in museum spaces. We wanted to consider the ethical obligations of museums when working with victims and survivors of conflict. And we wanted to enable museum professionals to hear directly from external partners about their expectations, their experiences, and recommendations when working with museums, again, in that space where we're trying to represent contested history. So I'm delighted to be here today and to be a part of this panel. I'm gonna introduce you to the speakers, and then they're gonna go, it's their preference to go one after another, and we've decided to stay safely in this nice safe space of the table, as opposed to the podium. So directly to my left here is Karen Logan. Karen is the curator of history with National Museums Northern Ireland and the project curator of Collecting the Troubles and Beyond, which, which is expressed in the exhibition that you saw last night when you were partying. After years of research and consultation and collection development, the Ulster Museum's new Troubles and Beyond Gallery opened to the public on the 30th of March, 2018. It powerfully examines our recent past through a remarkable range of objects that reflect the diverse perspectives and experiences of those who lived through the Troubles and are still living with it. And Karen is going to discuss the curatorship of this gallery and the approaches that were taken by the National Museum's Northern Ireland in curating dissent responsibly. Beside Karen is Damien McNally. Damien works in association with WAVE Trauma Center, which provides care and support for people affected by the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And Damien was one of the sitters for Colin Davidson's Silent Testimony exhibition at the Ulster Museum, which reveals the stories of 18 people who are connected by their individual experiences of loss through the Troubles. Based on that experience, he seeks to continue the conversation but advocates for the development of a different narrative around the Troubles, one that depoliticizes it, and as he'll talk about, aligned with ideas of grief theory, one that opens up a wider conversation, but in a sensitive and an ethical way. Beside Damien is Brian Young, and Brian was a member of the punk band Rudy, which formed in 1975, and he continues to perform as the lead vocalist of the Sabre Jets. Rudy's classic hit, Big Time, was the first release on Belfast's famous Good Vibrations label, and the band performed alongside the Outcasts, Rufrex, the Undertones, and many more. And at Belfast punk scene, a vibrant manifestation of a broader UK subculture, constructed an alternative space that frequently challenged local sectarian identities. And with this direct experience, Brian can offer us an insight into the punk ethos, his experience of dissent within the context of the Troubles, and how he feels that the Ulster Museum has represented those aspects of our recent past. So we're gonna go one after another, and then we will open it up uh, to all of you for some questions. So Karen, if you wanna get started. Okay, thank you. So, so the uh, theme of our session is Dissent Without Desensitization, and I'm gonna speak a bit about curating the Troubles and beyond. This photograph shows the previous Troubles Gallery at the Austin Museum, which had remained unchanged since it opened in 2009, uh, following a period of refurbishment at the museum. And as you can see from the photograph, it's um, purely black and white images and text. There are no artifacts in that exhibition. It's very much the way that you would have seen the Troubles presented in the media through the lens of a photojournalist. And obviously the impact of the gallery was limited by that absence of original artifacts and alternative perspectives. 
So even at the time of opening, press reports of the gallery described it as bland, safe, and strenuously non-controversial. The past defeating the present for fear of giving events or causing controversy. So in 2015, we made a successful application to the Heritage Lottery Fund to address the limitations of the gallery through the Collecting Cultures program. So there are obvious challenges in curating difficult and contested history. The traumatic events of the years after 1968 touched almost everyone who lived here and many others from further afield. Inevitably, the interpretation of these events is contested in terms of significance, meaning and responsibility. While we have a shared past, we do not have a shared memory. And you can see here in the images on this slide, two posters from our collection that communicate very different perspectives on the UDR, the Ulster Defence Regiment. And the photograph on the bottom left shows a young girl who's just learned that her father has been killed and is very representative of the human impact that we need to remain mindful of. So in terms of balance, very deliberately in inverted commas, people often ask how we ensure balance is achieved, but that implies some sort of equilibrium uh, between two sides. The reality is much more complex and involves diverse perspectives. The visitors presented with a curated selection of objects and a range of perspectives, including individual testimonies, and must draw together their own interpretation. Our approach is intended to challenge ideas, debunk myths, and demonstrate the integrative complexity of the conflict. By interpreting diverse perspectives in context, alongside original artifacts and information drawn from scholarship, it is hoped that visitors gain a greater understanding of the history of Northern Ireland and how those different narratives intersect. It is much more about an editorial integrity and taking a critical approach that does not try to resolve the violence of the Troubles and its impact, but promotes dialogue and understanding. And that's where our responsibility relies, lies in relation to dissent without desensitization. So the gallery was redeveloped in phases. This has been a long um, process over the last couple of years. And some of the initial comments that we received, you can see on the screen here. Um, the majority of the responses were constructive but these comments were being made. There's no doubt that this is a divisive period of our history. There are some that oppose the very fact that we are bringing together these alternative perspectives. But to tell one part of the story and exclude another would limit the potential for peace building. So our aim was not to achieve consensus, but encourage narrative hospitality. <clears throat> there are a number of significant challenges in ensuring the ethical representation of a conflict which claimed thousands of lives. From the outset of the project, a strong ethical framework was established, guided by the principles of ethical remembering, those outlined by the Community Relations Council and the MA's Code of Ethics. There's a significant duty of care to victims and survivors when working in this area. The photograph you can see here on the slide is a photograph of Patrick Rooney, the first child to be killed during the Troubles, and his brother was one of those who came forward to share their experiences. At first, he was quite challenging of the museum's approach, but we worked with him and um, were able to share his story in the gallery. And he went on to say that, I hope this project gets people to reflect and think, was it really all worth it? Having said that, there's also the risk that placing an emphasis on the trauma of events results in personalization, psychologizing, and the production of emotion, which can make it difficult to interpret and understand the underlying factors more comprehensively. There are different perceptions that exist, interpretations, and the museum should be able to present this pluralism without bias, yet to assimilate all possible points of view can limit the, the audience's capacity to be critical or subversive. There are inherent risks in presenting memory and reflective opinion. The subjectivity can destabilize the narrative and it can be as much about forgetting and self-censoring. That said, the power of individual perspectives and personal responses is in evoking a recognitive response from the audience based on personal truth. So our decision was to present broader narratives counterpoised with individual voices, introducing a degree of criticality and subversion while maintaining inclusivity. And this is in the photograph of feature you can see where people have contributed their own stories and their own words, and that's um, where Patrick's brother's story is displayed as well. So the collecting activity and interpretive planning focused on wider social, cultural, and economic themes, not just exclusively on um, conflict and politics which enabled a much more nuanced and inclusive engagement with this complex period of history. And also the timeline of the new gallery does not end with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, but extends to the present day. 
and this inclusion of material relating to post-conflict Northern Ireland enables greater exploration of continuity and change within local society. So we've included objects um, around Brexit, um, issues of identity, flag protests, campaign for equal marriage, all very contemporary issues here. So after a long period of research, consultation and engagement and collection development, the Troubles and Beyond exhibition opened at the end of March to coincide with the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. And the same journalist who had um, made the comments that I quoted at the start of the presentation um, went on to say that this has been a brave move and while it is a difficult process, it's a necessary step forward. The response has been really positive and constructive and there's some more examples of the comments we've received here, which I'll let you read for yourselves, but just to point out a few um, that sort of struck me. Um, the top right there, this person is saying that they weren't directly affected by the troubles, though they knew people who died and know the, so the sound of gunfire and bombs, which is quite directly affected in my mind. And the other one just below that, the gallery made me feel uncomfortable. Have I done nothing to change things? That sense of re personal responsibility that somebody has come away with having seen the exhibition. We've also had comments, um, second one down on the left, about use of language. And there was a lot of discussion around that with our academic advisory group, but there are still issues around even the term of the troubles. Um, whether somebody was killed or murdered, whether it's conflict or terrorism, these sort of discussions continue. And another one there about how their view came from their education and raising, how segregated and biased they were. So it's really interesting to have these different perspectives. Another one saying that they're proud of the Ulster Museum, that we're not afraid to do this and we used to be so cautious. So there's a real range of perspectives, but at the same time, people um, vary so much in where they are in their personal journey. And one of the questions that we ask in our feedback form is if anybody has a story that they would like to share. And so far, more than one person has simply written, not yet. So it's very much a journey that is ongoing and a continuing process. So final slide, just to say that that conversation continues and we'll continue to feed that back into the exhibition. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Damien? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I hope you can hear me okay, and I hope you're not blinded by my head here. But anyway, <laughs> good on with it. Um, yeah, I, just, I wanted to talk to you today. I hope these slides come up here. But um, really just wanting to talk to you about the experience of um, Colin Davis' silent testimony. Um, I'm really wanting to talk about real, trying to realize the potential of that exhibition. Um, suppose if you're not really aware of it, it was basically Colin painted 18 people who were affected in different ways by the Troubles, and he tried to do that where he represented everybody, so people affected by loyalist or Republican violence, state violence, and also those affected by it from the Republic of Ireland and over in England. Um, so really what Colin was wanting to do with that exhibition um, he obviously, Colin here talks about his initial inspiration being the Good Friday Agreement and saying that it really had very little to offer, um, really kind of people who, who were, who'd be termed as victims or what they had lost. So he wanted to document that and he felt that the whole area of victims and survivors had been politicized in this place over the last 20 years, really since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. And he wanted to look at the human suffering rather than Protestant suffering or Catholic suffering. So. Really, what Colin wanted to do was just put a, a face to those people sometimes who were affected, and as paintings very, say very, very little about, just tell you who the person is and how they were affected, but it says nothing else about it, really, who was responsible, and that sort of thing. So he, for me, his dissent is saying that he wants to look at the human suffering as opposed to Protestant or Catholic suffering, and that's what I would think I would, I'd like to talk about whenever I'm talking about dissent today, that's what I'm talking about, a focus on human suffering, so it's not about Protestants, Catholics, we can't get away from that, and I understand that, but I think that places like museums can provide that space to continue the conversation that Colin has started um, with his exhibition. Now, the exhibition was here in the Austin Museum in 2015, and then it was here for a couple of weeks to mark the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. The exhibition's been over in Paris, it's been over uh, down in Dublin, it's been over in the United Nations building there a couple of weeks ago, so and it'll move somewhere else. But I think that's, that's great and that's a conversation starter, but it's something that we can continue on, probably back here at home and using spaces like as museums to continue the conversation. And this is particularly important at the moment when we don't have any kind of, um, there's like, unlikely to be a political settlement here and political agreement on how to deal with the legacy of the past. And we're gonna wait and wait and while Brexit's on the horizon, things are unlikely to improve here politically. 
So again, this is me saying how museums can maybe carry on a conversation that's been started by people like Colin Davidson and others. So I'm just showing you some of the, the, uh, the paintings from uh, Colin Davidson's um, exhibition. There's 16 of the 18 here, okay? So this is the only picture I could find that had as many on it as you could actually see. So there's 16 of the 18 people, and I just wanted to um, say something about two of the people who aren't on that 16. They're just, again, you're, some of you are familiar with the exhibition and some aren't. So this first person is Margaret Yemen, and Margaret was injured in a bomb explosion uh, in Banbridge in 1982. Um, and this is basically the first exhibition where, or the first place that Margaret has ever been seen or photographed without wearing her glasses. And obviously Margaret was blinded uh, in that bomb. So again, that's an example of somebody who has been injured as a result of the troubles here. Again, as you'll see from the descriptions, it really doesn't say much else about who did it. It's just Margaret and what has happened to her. And another person there is Maureen Reed. Maureen's husband was killed in 1976, and she had, she had 10 children, so she had to raise 10 children on her own. And uh, Maureen, unfortunately, has since died. That painting was taken. So again, it, it really lets people see the, the, kind of the urgency behind a lot of this. That it's paintings of people who are no longer with us, unfortunately, and their, um, you know, their, their, their suffering goes on. And, and Colin has caught that very well, captured it very well. Um, Again, Thomas O'Brien, again, it's just to give the southern dimension, his, his, uh, Thomas's brother and his sister-in-law and both of their children were killed in the Dublin bomb in 1974. So again, we, um, Colin, Wave, and uh, everybody involved just wanted to be able to represent those who were affected by, by the troubles, really, in, in the south. And then another example is Mo, Mo Norton, whose uh, brother was killed in a bomb explosion in England. Again, it's, it's, it's providing an example of... Um, the wider impact of the troubles here. Now, you have me, Scary, here, Ming the Merciless here, whatever you want to call me, but um, um, this is basically me. My father was killed uh, in 1976 when I was four months old. Um, and there you have it. Um, and this is a picture of my dad, Paul. And uh, this picture was taken in 1968. Now, why I've, I've chosen this picture, um, it's him and his motorbike. I think they were about 18 at that time, so God knows what they were up to here, what they were doing. Clearly no health and safety back then, helmets or nothing. Um, but it's really, see, look, if you look at this building behind him, it's, it used to be a grocer's. So this is 50 years ago, and you, you see two roofs. There's actually another roof behind that. So that's that building there today, 19, uh, 2018. So not, not much has changed. It's turned into a library. So that's, that's, the, um, that's basically, this is basically an interface area in Belfast. This is really the interface between Ardoin and really moving on behind that library into more of the kind of Protestant area of the town and moving on more into the Shankle area. And if you, if you look at, uh, sorry, if you're looking at Google Maps here and you turn to your left, this is what you'll see here. So this is a roundabout here, and over the last number of years in Belfast, there's been, um, this has basically had been a sectarian flashpoint with a lot of rioting going on here. So you have one community in the green here. So these buildings here on your left behind the green arrow is the Ardoin area, where my father was from and where we were from. And then the orange arrow signifies the Protestant communities over in the Shankle. And really this is the interface where they came together. And over the last number of years, there's been a contentious parade coming down this road and been a lot of rioting and that sort of thing. But what I was just wanting to emphasize is that just behind that green arrow over there is the corner of the street where that's where my father was shot and, and killed. He, he died, um, he shot on a Saturday and he died on a Monday. And it's to say that because of these narratives between these two communities, this community of Ardoin and, and the Shankle here, so the people from the Shankle came over, just basically my father was the first person he saw, saw and thought, right, well, this is going to be a Catholic, so we'll shoot them. And obviously, people from Ardoin on, up behind the Green Arrow are those who were involved in the Shankle bomb. So people from that area went over into the Shankle and killed, killed people who were just going about their ordinary, everyday business. So what I'm trying to emphasize is that just the, the, the stories of these people, these just normal people getting on with their lives, gets, gets lost within the kind of very um, polarized narratives about what happened in Northern Ireland. And I'm just really trying to give you an example of, of, of what, what, you know, example of one case or that had happened. Um, so this is really, this is really Ardoin, as you would see it now. This is the same road, and this is where the, um, this is some of the, the protests around the parade that was coming down the road. As you look at it, it actually looks like the police are beating each other up there, but uh, they're actually um, fighting with rioters there. And then you'll see another example there of the, the police presence on that road. If you see just that, that kind of greeny building there behind, that's the library I talked about earlier on there. So you see that at certain times of the year, and obviously during the Troubles, this was you know, a major, major flashpoint. Okay, so again, 
these are areas with very kind of difficult political issues to deal with, but it's the people behind them um, whose stories ultimately get lost within these kind of political narratives and the political arguments around the whole thing. But that's just one example from, from Belfast. Again, it's just really trying to set it in perspective uh, in terms of the numbers. You know, this is the status of people killed in the Troubles, and it's really just to say, look, this is from the Lost Lives book that came out just documenting the stories of all those killed, that 56% of people were civilians. And I would have to say that from my perspective, a lot of the stories of those civilians are the ones that don't get told. Um, everybody has a right, everybody, well, security forces, Republicans and loyalists have all the right, have, have the right to have their story told. But again, it's just getting a, a bit of balance in there because the stories of these individuals get lost and these kind of statistics get lost behind the whole thing. So I'm sorry to kill you just with a couple of PowerPoint slides as we finish here, but what I'm saying is I understand that we can't depoliticize what happened here in Northern Ireland, okay? There's, there's strong community voices, political voices and community narratives, and there's no political agreement at the minute on what, how to deal with the past. So when there's no political agreement, all progress seems to stop. And I think that's really important where museums can step in into that gap, into that kind of, that sentence. Everybody's kind of sitting back now, waiting to see what happens with, with uh, whether there'll be another storm, whether there'll be a, you know, a, a, um, a fresh start agreement, what will happen after Brexit. So because of all these things happen, it doesn't make us less likely to deal with, deal with these kind of issues. And one particular issue I uh, would get particularly vexed about would be when people have been murdered, it can, it can be termed very easily as war and conflict, you know, and one of the things I would have heard quite regularly was, you know, your dad mustn't have been killed for nothing. He wouldn't have just been shot for no reason. Going, actually, he was. He was just out do doing his normal, engaging in his normal business. Wasn't involved in anything. And we maybe need to look at this kind of this just world hypothesis. You know, that states that people feel a need to believe that their environment is just an orderly place where people usually get what they deserve. So that's all almost a way of kind of people justifying in their own heads. Well, that was the trouble. So they must have been involved in something. We we'll kind of stay away from it. And I can understand why people do because it's so heavily politicised. But it's something that we need to look at, look at, you know, this whole thing of no smoke without fire, you know, victim blaming and that sort of thing. So, again, a museum is a place where you maybe, maybe we can address some of these issues. Okay, so, really, we're asking, why do we still live, live with the legacy of the past and all that? What is it? And, we, you know, we need to kind of talk about, use the context on a framework of just talking about grief. It's not all about politics. It's just about what people are, 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 are living through and why it doesn't seem to go on for years and years. And there's only, there's basically two people from the kind of grief literature field I'd like to briefly talk about would be, one would be Pauline Boss, who's really kind of coined this phrase around ambiguous loss, and that talks about loss where there's a lot of ambiguity, there's a lot of unanswered questions. She did a lot of work with families uh, after 9-11, basically where, where bodies weren't found, where people had a lot of questions about how their loved one died. So when people in Northern Ireland and other conflict zones don't get kind of justice or don't get questions answered, they can't grieve properly, the grief process becomes frozen. And then another aspect is disenfranchised grief, and this is a person called Kenneth Doka, who talks about this, how because of the characteristics of people and their experiences, a lot of their grief isn't acknowledged by other people. So I've written some work about young people in Northern Ireland and how their kind of grief wasn't listened to either during the Troubles or now, whenever they want, you know, whenever they want to find out a bit more. You also talk about those living with injury, particularly the injured in Northern Ireland, who don't show up really, you know, there's some statistics around it, but nobody really, they've no kind of access to justice and that sort of thing. So again, these are just a couple of examples why you would say, why doesn't this just go away? We've, we've, you know, it's, it's so long ago, why can't we just deal with this? It's because there's so many unanswered questions and the way political things are set up here, people aren't likely to get those answers. Okay, so I'll not go through all of those. But what I would say, it would be probably helpful for a space like a museum and others to say, okay, what are the commonalities of this, what people have gone through here? How do we look at, people haven't got answers to their questions, and that's fair enough, but there's other examples and scenarios where people haven't got answers to questions about how a loved one died or, or, you know, or whatever else has happened. So I've used some of those examples, like the historical institutional abuse that's currently ongoing, and it may be signed off at the minute by the civil service, but that's all in the air at the minute. So people are, you know, have lots of questions about what happened there. People over in Hillsborough, you know, the Hillsborough disaster, they had an awful lot of unanswered questions about how loved, loved ones died, and there was victim blaming went on about blaming, blaming Liverpool fans about what happened. The Grenfell Tower, people asking questions about why um, there was, you know, people had concerns around the building at the time, so why, why wasn't that dealt with? The Stardust disaster in Dublin where young, 40, I think it was 48 young people were killed in that, and again un unanswered questions about how a fire started and then trying to blame, well, it was kind of a bit of controversy about blaming the young people involved in that, that somebody set it on fire as opposed to an electrical fault. The tomb bodies, 
issue around unanswered questions about what happened there, Manchester Arena, the current issue around London knife crime and how kind of, you know, be careful not to write people and communities off. And the whole issue around, last days around um, suicide, um, you know, the stigma around that, and hopefully that stigma is disappearing to a certain extent. But again, it's a whole issue around unanswered questions. So what I would really like, you know, I'd, I think museums would be a good place to look at the, the common features of dealing with the legacy of the troubles, but then how that relates to other, other significant events and issues. That's all I could say. Thank you. Brian? Right. Um, I'm here to talk about punk rock in the late 70s in Belfast, so that's probably a bit of light relief. Um, for those of you under 50, which is probably more of you out there than us up here, sorry, that's, punk rock, I suppose, first raised its head amongst the Seamsters in downtown New York in the mid-70s, as a coterie of ex-glam rockers, failed artists, junkies and poets ditched their glitter threads, adopting a back-to-basics approach as a reaction to the boring excesses of AOR and prog rock. By far the most influential of this bunch were the Ramones, who mixed 50s rock and roll, 60s bubblegum, and their very own Mondo minimalism to, to create a unique new sound unlike anything anyone had ever heard before. Their first album came out early in 1976, and thanks to the UK rock press and the likes of John Peel, was snapped up by those teenagers who were bored stupid with the lame disco music and dross that clogged up the charts and were looking for something new to call their own. I got one of the first US import copies of the album and Caroline music here in Belfast and it turned my world upside down overnight, hammering home the eternal truth that you don't have to be able to play 17 chords or be a musical virtuoso to write great songs and that if you couldn't say everything you wanted to in a three minute single, then it wasn't worth saying in the first place. Closer to home in London, would-be Svengali's Malcolm McLaren and Bernie Rhodes ripped off Richard Hale's spiky haircut and torn t-shirt, adding in the doll's bad attitude and some half-baked situationist hippie slogans, coming up with something more relevant to this side of the pond. And it wasn't long before I started to hear about these new London punk rock bands with thought-provoking names such as the Sex Pistols, the Damned and the Clash. Ironically, if one place on earth was primed and ready for punk, it was Belfast. And when punk finally reached here, it hit harder and lasted longer than anywhere else. By necessity, it was DIY all the way, kick-started by a handful of semi-delinquent and disgruntled teens who were pissed off with the status quo and the band's status quo too, and had the grit, spunk and determination to go out and do something about it. There were no punk swing galleys, record labels, haberdashers or trendy boutiques over here, so while others roared with laughter, a nation of spotty teenagers hacked and chopped away at their hair and clothes, to get that snappy new look down just right. I still laugh when I recall the Fiorari one punkette inspired in the local press by turning up for a cancelled clash gig using a kettle for a handbag. The existing music industry was dead in its feet here, monopolised on one side by 60s throwback show band mafia and on the other by a weird conglomeration of ageing hippies who all claimed to have been the band with Van Morrison at one time. None of their few remaining venues would let us darken their doors. So we booked function rooms in notorious East Belfast dives like the Glen Mackin and Garden Lodge, holding private parties which we then played at, packing them out with hundreds of underage teenagers just looking for a good time and escape from what was going on around them. For a very long time, Rudy, the band I was in, were the only local combo remotely resembling a punk band, and it wasn't until late 1977 that others followed suit. But unlike the American and UK prime movers, most all the bands here were still teenagers, and almost without exception, it was the first time they'd ever set foot on a stage. Amazingly, whilst ambition often exceeded ability, these new bands knocked out a pretty impressive racket, displaying a diversity and instinctive knack of knocking out killer material that belied their tender years. Paradoxically, though, on the surface, we may have embraced the studied nihilism and desire to shock and outrage from UK punk, the impact of punk here was resolutely positive, though most definitely more by accident than design. Once city centre venues like the Hart Bar were established, again by local teenagers initially, people were able to venture outside their own areas, meeting up with their contemporaries from the other side of the divide for possibly the first time ever, and transcending the existing barriers of class and religion. For sure, not every spiky top was non-sectarian, but generally what was most important was the band you liked, not what foot you kicked with. You were punk first and everything else was secondary. 
people realised instinctively too that they had much more in common with their supposed enemies on the other side than they had with many of their neighbours. This wasn't the big, big news in London, Manchester or New York, but in Belfast it was quite literally life-changing. And once the genie's out of the bottle, he's not going back in. And so punk was a positive force here, bringing people together, making a real difference to individual lives and perceptions, and providing an opportunity and impetus to look at things in a new light. But that's if you wanted to. So while it didn't change the world, it certainly did change my world and opened my eyes and made me at least think differently about a lot of things I'd pre previously taken for granted. And I wasn't the only one. But getting back to the subject in hand, dissent, because that's, I suppose, what we're here for, wasn't really something that most teenage punk rockers here would have concerned themselves overly about back in the day. But it's true that dissent plays an integral role in any youth movement, even if it's only down to shocking the general public with some spiffy threads or a preposterous haircut. Punk was different from previous youth movements in that questioning, rejecting and destroying was the status quo, which is almost the textbook definition of dissent, and that was its initial raison d'etre. Initially, too, punk attracted the misfits, the loners and the oddballs, welcoming and celebrating diversity in all its forms. Again, this was an organic and accidental process, and it was an unexpected irony that such a nihilistic and superficially destructive movement would have such a positive impact on the ground. It can certainly be argued that folks like Malcolm McLaren and Bernie Rhodes only used punk as a market employee to sell overpriced bondage, strides and t-shirts, but the impact here was much more far-reaching and positive especially as the significance of the DIY ethic embodied by the remarkable rise of the independent record labels associated with punk came to the fore. Paradoxically too, while dissent is often linked to a political ideology, it's perhaps worth commenting that punk here, during the period I was involved, sort of 76 to 81, remained largely apolitical, as being seen to support or be aligned with an established political viewpoint or party here would automatically link you forever to one side only. It was for that very reason that an attempt to establish a rock against sectarianism organisation here floundered in 1978. Punks realised instinctively not only what united, but what also divided them too. That's a history lesson over. Um, the Troubles and Beyond exhibition, I've donated some old posters and tickets and whatever else too, and Karen had asked me my opinion of the exhibition. And it's just really like to reflect, when I was growing up, museums always played it safe. You've got saber-toothed tigers, mummies, and always the Romans. But even when I was in school, our history lessons avoided any contentious periods, and there was never an attempt made to address any contemporary issues. And here in Northern Ireland, where people still travel long distances to be offended, I suppose that's understandable, especially where public money's involved. Even though we have a shared history, many of the general public still want museums to reflect only their perception of history and to reinforce their beliefs and prejudices. And the last thing they want to see is an exhibition celebrating, or worse still, justifying the other side. So to my way of thinking, it's brave to see the Troubles and Beyond Gallery and the Ulster Museum attempt to reflect a shared history without trying to take sides or pass any moral judgment. So while you have the expected loyalist and Republican displays, you also have other exhibits that reflect the impact events here had on the ordinary public. And by presenting personalised accounts of individual experiences, it brings home the fact that every statistic in the Troubles, regardless of their circumstances, was a living, breathing human being with a unique story of their own. It's important too to remember that throughout those years, many people never fitted neatly into or rejected the simplistic orange-green confines. And I guess that's where punk comes in, as it enabled many young people to take on a new identity even if only temporarily, free from those very constraints. It's early days, yeah, but I'd like to see less concentration on the bands and the music, as frankly that was often the most boring part of punk, and see more fanzines and printed material alongside contemporary photographs and accounts of the impact punk had on individual people's lives. Much more inspiring than a bunch of scratchy old 45s or Greg Cowan's ridiculous leather jodhpurs. Also, I'd like to see material relating to the anarcho-punk scene here of the mid-80s and beyond, even if just for balance. I do remain wary of some of the more fanciful claims about punk did or didn't achieve here in Belfast, as there's a definite rose-tinted nostalgia and revisionism of sorts at work, which is no place in punk as I remember it. Historically, too, it's readily apparent that so many of the more popular punk acts were aging never has been, who'd been traipsing unsuccessfully around the gig circuit for years, and who realised that a quick haircut and change of image was their ticket to the big time. 
And the blunt truth, like it or not, is that any punk band who ever signed a major was no different from the Bay City Rollers or any other manufactured pop act or image. But it didn't mean they didn't make some great records. But then punk wasn't perfect. Despite that, I'm still fond of and fiercely proud of my punk years, though I'm more than a bit apprehensive at being seen as a museum piece. I gotta admit, and finishing up here too, it's kind of depressing to look at the various orange-green photos and exhibits from events I remember from my teenage years and realize that 40 years on, nothing seems to have changed. In fact, if I'm honest, right now things seem to be moving backwards. So I guess that's why it's good to see punk in there too, even if it's just to remind people that there's always an alternative to whether today's apathetic younger generation can drag themselves away from their 24-hour-a-day anti-social media and must-have devices for long enough to do anything about it is another matter. That's me. Thank you uh, very much. We're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Can we get the house lights up so that you guys can see everybody out there? Is that possible? Um, and I think there's a microphone. There should be a microphone somewhere, or I can run down with that one. So, there we go. Lights are up. So, does anybody have questions for any of the speakers? Oh, there we go. Hello, is it on? Oh, yes. Um, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Um, one of the things that's, I guess, kind of become clear is that when there is an absence of the sort of um, state-imposed truth and reconciliation type movement that, that South Africa had, um, that other groups kind of fill the gaps and that those uh, groups tend to be um, bottom up, you know, they tend to be community groups, they tend to be smaller museums or, or larger museums or within the cultural sector or within um, other areas, the creative sectors. Um, do you think that that now is the only way um, to kind of go forward, to bridge any of these gaps, to, to bring people together? Um, or is there a sense that we're still waiting for some kind of um, a bigger process to take place that will help with this effort to um, come to some agreement about what the truth of the past is and, and move on. Um, I suppose in terms of truth recovery it's quite difficult and as Damien was saying there's a lot of unanswered questions and there will probably always be a lot of unanswered questions. Um, there's a lot of work here in terms of Consultate. There was a public consultation recently on how to address the legacy of the past and a lot of work being done uh, on the ground in relation to that. I suppose in terms of the museum, what I would hope we could do is begin to build understanding. So maybe people don't necessarily recover the truth and facts of details of what happened, but begin to understand a bit more where alternative um, perspectives were coming from and how maybe certain sets of circumstances evolved in the context in which they evolved. I, know, I think um, I think it's probably just good to have a, a, a mix. I think there was um, a radio program by Mark Rothers on last week. I can't remember if they called it um, Dark Tourism, but it's talking about a lot of work that loyalists and Republicans are doing, kind of setting up Roman kind of community museums and that sort of thing. So, you know, I've, I have absolutely no issue with that. I think it's everybody has their narratives to, uh, to tell. But I think places maybe like the museum and, and other spaces could provide a a bit of a balance to that and provide a space where maybe people who don't feel comfortable, who don't feel overly political, can maybe feel they can have a space to engage in the conversation as well. That it's not just a, um, you know, you know, I don't want to be in that it's only kind of victims, and I don't like that term either, or they feel they're the only ones that have anything to say about what happened in Northern Ireland over the last 50 years. Everybody was living in it. So I think spa um, places like museums can provide you know, and particularly the Austin Museum and others can provide that, that kind of space to enable them to have a bit of freer expression to talk about what they lived through, you know. Brian, did you come in? Um, I just think over here you have to get away from the same old orange and green stuff. And how you do that, I don't know. You know, that's, that, that's the difficulty with any museum, is that people just go to reinforce their own prejudices. If you can get something I don't know, 
because you're dealing with a difficult and contentious subject, how do you explain to somebody who has already got their mind made up about something that there's another perspective? And I suppose where you can see the two main narratives side by side, even if it takes a while, maybe it gives them then, maybe they realise, well, look, there's other people's opinions. But again, it's Northern Ireland and the way things are here at the minute, it's, you know, it's not going to change anytime soon, I don't think. I think the other question around, following on from Brian, was about the question of audience. And in the discussions that we were having over the exhibition, there was a lot of tension around um, how the local audiences would relate to the exhibition, and there's a lot of sensitivities around that. But then there were questions around, well, there's, of course, there's now, now, there are a lot more people coming into Belfast and they don't know anything about the Troubles, so how do you also provide information about what happened, put that in quotes, right, what happened, but then also be sensitive to the local context about when you tell the story about what happened, it's not as simple as just listing facts. So there were some really interesting and quite contentious understandings around how you speak to those uh, multiple audiences. Is there uh, other questions in the audience? There's one down here. Can we, here, she's coming here. Hi there. Um, I work for a Holocaust survivors charity based in Yorkshire. Um, and we recently owned a new exhibition and learning centre in collaboration with the University of Huddersfield. It's been open six weeks. Um, and in the exhibition, we tell the story of the Holocaust through the eyes of 16 people who experienced it, either as refugees who came here before 1939 but lost a lot of their family, or as survivors of camps of forced labour and of other atrocities. Um, so what you were saying about loss and trauma and people's personal experiences really resonated with me. Obviously, we work with people who've experienced really significant trauma. Um, and that is generational, so it's not just the survivors, it's their children, it's their grandchildren, and their relationship to the history is complex and emotive and challenging. We're finding since we've been open, even in just a short time, that we've got more people now coming forward with stories, they want to share their stories, and that is often difficult for them and traumatic. So I'm really interested in the process of developing the gallery and your ways of working with your participants, volunteers, staff, everybody who was involved really, and what support you had in place or felt that you needed in place to enable people to work with those stories in a supported way. And is there anything maybe in retrospect that you might have done differently or think that you could have done to make that process I don't, I don't want to say easier, because it's never going to be easy for the participants, but just to support them and make sure that they are at the, the heart of the experience. Yeah, I mean, we would say we were very conscious of the ethical responsibilities around that, and we would have worked closely with um, WAVE, Damien uh, represents, and Community Relations Council, and others, victims, and um, survivor service, and so on. So we would have consulted a lot in terms of our approach and ident we identified early on in the project a set of key principles with the academic advisory group that would underpin our approach um, and in terms of within the gallery we have um, signposted sources of support if people are affected by what they see and, and where to go to get further support and we have facilitated some training for our front of house staff as well in how to respond if anybody uh, in the gallery was affected. So it's something that sort of was very much built in to the project. Um, in terms of people coming forward, we had open calls in the gallery to invite people to come forward with objects and stories. We had press releases and um, media sort of campaigns to bring people forward as well and worked with them in terms of what they wanted to contribute. Some people gave us objects um, or stories or photographs. Some people lent us things or just let us copy or digitize something. Um, some people just rang up and said, you're the creator of this exhibition and I want you to know this. And it's like, okay, what do we do with that? So it was sort of trying to manage all those different um, responses, which came from all across the province and all different um, backgrounds and experiences from women that worked as a nurse during the Troubles, um, ex-servicemen, ex-prisoners, all, all sort of uh, different backgrounds and points of view. So it was sort of managing that and working with them to see how they could best feed into the project. And then once we opened the exhibition, we took a lot of time we didn't have a launch as such, but we took a lot of time to invite 
those people that had contributed to see the exhibition and to go around it with myself and um, see what we had done with their contribution, which was important as well. Did you want to come in? Can we just, just maybe pick up on the last part of the question, which I thought was quite interesting in, in retrospect? You know, I suppose I've heard a lot of discussion here about what happens after an exhibition. And we do all this evaluation and what do we do with it? But I think it's also important to ask, you know, in retrospect, what might you have done differently? Or another question would be if, you know, if you were the curator of the show, I mean, you are, Karen, but, uh, you know, is there an object, a story, a thing that you think isn't in there that could be in there? And the reason I say that is because I know that part of the, the, the key objective that we agreed was also that this is, a, this is an ongoing exhibition in the sense that it, we're moving away from that sense that exhibitions close and then you open a new one. It's about keeping it open and keeping the space open for new things to happen. So. I'm just wondering if, if Brian or Damien had any sense. If you were the curators, if you were the curators of the museum, is there something that you would have put in or a story that you would have put in or a space you would have opened up? Um, I mean, I'd probably just go back to those last two slides I referred to. Um, I'd just like to get back to saying that why are we still dealing with this after so many years? Um, and, and able to be a space where um, any, anybody who's lived here is able to go in and say, actually, I can relate to that experience. I, I witnessed something. Uh, I lost a friend. I lost, you know, a lot of people who've lost friends and colleagues feel I'm not a victim. It's not my place to talk about this. But actually, you can have that space to say, actually, no, you are welcome to come and speak about this. You know, people from different countries and say, actually, I've had an experience similar to that. I've been through a traumatic experience, whatever it is, whatever the background to it. That, um, it's really just tackling people's sense of isolation. That's only me that's gone through this. Nobody knows how I feel. And I think a museum could be a really good space for tackling that isolation. So that's, that's the thing that, that's the word that always sticks with me. Mm. You know? Brian, did you want to? I just think it's important to show the, the humanity of people and the individuals involved because a lot of people here, if they go into the museum and they walk into the troubles, but the first thing they see is the usual flags and emblems, they'll just turn and walk out because they go, because they're sick to the back teeth of them. And it's getting past that. It's getting past, I mean, I'm, there's nothing wrong with flags and emblems or whatever, but it, it's getting people to not just switch you off whenever they see the same stuff over and over again. It's given a more of a perspective on it. And if they can just bring it down more to the, I suppose, the personal stories, and then people realize that, you know, underneath it all, there's a, you know, there's a human being, there's a, and it doesn't really matter you know, what side they're from or whatever, but it's very, very hard. People are so, especially people, older people will sort of want, again, they'll want to see, they'll sort of want to have their prejudices confirmed, a lot of them. Younger people probably won't be any the wiser and they'll be going in, oh, my granny told me this and such and such. So it's just getting past the usual divisions that you get here over, you know, over history, so how just, do you do that? Sorry, um, I just say that I, I feel the Dutch Museum through sign and testament and the work that um, Karen has done, they've done a really good job on it, and they should be con congratulated for the work they've done so far. Mm -hmm. Is there other questions or comments or thoughts from the audience? There's a couple, there's one here. And there's one at the back as well. Hi, um, I just wanted to just ask Karen if you could just say a little bit more about how you did work with your museum assistants and others who are perhaps you know, in the galleries and whether you're carrying on that discussion internally as well as externally with people outside the museum. Yes, well, as I say, we um, had training from WAVE in terms of how to respond to uh, working in a gallery that could potentially um, emotionally affect people that were uh, visiting. And we also did a lot of work to sort of familiarize them with the content and our approach to it so that um, if anybody was asking them, they would um, be able to respond. I think there's more that we can do to enable visitor services staff to um, discuss some of the objects at length and um, facilitate tours and so on because now that the gallery is open, and sort of an answer to Debbie's previous point about you know what we would do different and about the capacity. Now that that section of work is complete, we're in the next stage of the process that we can do a lot more engagement um, in this space with community groups, um, with schools, universities, 
because um, there is a lot of interest now and increasing interest. So I want to work more closely with visitor services now that um, they can help me deliver some of that um, and be able to use this, this space more effectively. Okay. There's a question at the back. Here. Sorry? There's one here. Oh, there's one. Sorry. Go ahead. And then there's one at the back. <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask you about unresolved complexity. I'm really interested in the exhibitions being unresolved, that what Brian is talking about is the humanity of all parties, all of them thinking they had a stake in it and the stake was oppositional to other people's stake. Did the staff itself want to continuously resolve it? Was it hard to keep the exhibition unresolved and uh, parallel? How hard was it in your training not to do a summary of what you thought you were looking at? Um, no, I don't think it was hard because I think it was always our intention to um, bring all those different perspectives together. In many ways, the objects themselves can communicate some of that. And um, yes, we set it in context, and yes, there's text. Um, there's actually two sets of text. There's one that's more about the sort of social, cultural, economic, political history, um, and references international context and events as well, and one that speaks more directly to the conflict, um, called Years of Darkness, where we address some of the things where maybe we don't have um, objects to represent. So we sort of framed it that way. Um, but we didn't actually try to achieve any sort of consensus or agreed narrative or summarize as you go to the exhibition, right, this is, this is how it's all going to neatly tie together for you. Um, it's very much left open and it's very much left as you've gone through, because it's arranged chronologically as well, it's sort of like you go through a journey and um, it's almost in a sense, I think, like a life lived that you've gone through it and you've seen things from all different sides, you've seen positive and negative, um, and by the time you come out, it's not really about having a sort of agreed version of it, or um, it's just sort of coming away, understanding this is actually more complex than I thought, and I've still got some questions even when I go out. Okay. Hello, hi, um, my name is Jane Wiles. I work at Tate Modern, um, where I run a program called Tate Exchange, which is a space for conversations to collide. Um, very much my whole practice has really been kind of like dominated by a lot of like the lessons that I learned as a young person growing up in Belfast. Um, you know, during the week wrestling with kind of my own identity of having a Protestant father and a Catholic mother, but then on my weekends kind of escaping in this amazing, lawless, sweaty box called Gyros, um, which was real like hub of a lot of the punk scene. And I think it's really important, Brian, to, to listen to you and talk about that because um, you know, not to brush anything under the carpet or put a lot of conversations behind, but like that kind of fluidity of my identity and working that out was just something that I couldn't find in other spaces. Um, and I think that there are a lot of lessons to be learned from that and the conditions that allowed that to come out. Um, and I think it's really great to hear you talking about punk in this space. I think that we as museums and institutions have so much to learn from that space of anarchy. Um, and I wonder if the panel have anything to comment on that specifically, on the conditions for speaking and um, different ideas to collide. Brian, do you want to start? I just like to say, yeah, it, it, it's Jarrow's for some reason always seems to get overlooked when people talk about Northern Ireland punk. And I, I think the reason for, first of all, Jarrow's was much more politically aware because I suppose it was inspired a lot by the anarcho bands like Cross and the like. But Jarrow's did an awful lot of real, now there's the initial Northern Ireland punk pre Jarrow's, which is sort of centered on the hard bar and whatever else. And, and that was a different animal, to be honest. Um, you know, the initial Northern Ireland punk was a reaction against everything. It was a rejection of politics and the politics that we were rejecting were the politics were around us. Um, and you weren't really, when I mean, you were 16, 17, 18, you weren't really thinking much more forward than that. But a lot of the people then that had come along to that, you know, that were involved in the earlier thing, a lot of them then drifted off into whatever else. You know, fashion changed, punk changed, music changed, Certainly after 1981, I wouldn't have regarded myself as a punk at all uh, because punk by that stage had become 
a type of music that I didn't like. It had become, to me, it had become a lump and parody of what the original individuality and excitement of punk was about. To me, it had become a sort of cliche. But on the other side of that, you had got the whole sort of, you know, the, the anarchist and crass bands who were, music was really like a secondary thing to them. They were more interested in pushing, um, you know, a, an ideal uh, and a worldview and whatever else. But that inspired the likes of Gyros and Warzone and whatever else. And to me, they, they don't get any sort of mention in the punk books. I think it's simply because there were no hit records. Um, the media like to go back, oh, here's Stiff Little Fingers and the Undertones, which is, if that's what you judge Northern Ireland punk by, you're missing 99.9% .9 of what it was about. And Gyros won't get a mention because, again, the bands weren't radio friendly, the media basically ignored them and still do. And Jaros did so much work on the ground, um, so much more than say that the, the, the harp was a sort of a, what's the word for it? It was an organic sort of coming together of people whereas Jaros had sort of like set ideals and whatever else and they were able to make, do much more on the ground to help people, to, you know, with safe and friendly meeting spaces with their vegetarian cafe and with their rehearsal rooms and, you know, uh, helping bands record and recording studios and putting on gigs. So they actually did much more um, physically on the ground than the earlier sort of um, dilettante punks would have done, you know. Uh, and certainly there's, there was like a there was like a cut off between there's the, the earlier punk and then there's this later punk and then it's just like any sort of youth movement. But certainly Jaros should, you know, as, as I said myself, I, I wasn't particularly involved in it, I knew a lot of people were, but certainly, you know, if anywhere here deserves mentioned in, in the museum and in anything to do with dissent, Jaros was certainly a very important place in the 80s and right through, I mean, I think, the last war zone only just closed a few weeks ago there. And I'm sure they'll come up with something else, you know, so it doesn't go away. Uh, I'm afraid our time has, has come to an end here, but um, I think we've heard some really interesting and enlivening stories about the everyday lives that went on during the Troubles and how this museum is trying to capture some of those stories of everyday life. And perhaps just reflecting on Brian's final comments here, it's left us with a really important question at the end of the conference, which is how can a punk ethos shape museum practice? So if you can join me in thanking a, a terrific panel. Thank you. Thank you.